uh, who was ordained in 1977. He uh, is doctor in canon law, and he is a member of the Holy See's diplomatic service since 1984. And uh, he was consecrated bishop in 2004, nuncio in several countries, and he now heads the diplomatic service of the refugee uh, emergency. We have discussed about how to build coalitions for change with people of different creeds, and uh, we had the enormous uh, 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 blessing yesterday. First instruction to follow the guidelines and the agenda of the Holy See in international organizations, because that's really an expression. Mr. President, distinguished guests, dear friends, thank you for your kind words of introduction, somewhat flattering. I think we should always remember that the uh, first diplomat of the Holy See is the Holy Father himself, and after that, the Cardinal Secretary of State, who is a former undersecretary in the department that, that I head, is very much at the, uh, at the front of what we, what we are doing diplomatically throughout the world. And uh, I run the office, and that's about it, I think. <laughs> so. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to have the opportunity to discuss the principal themes that mark the interventions of the Holy See at the various international and multilateral fora. In doing so, I hope not only to offer you a vision of the relations between the Holy See and the community of nations, but above all, to invite you to consider some of the concerns that move Pope Francis and to consider ways in which you might make these concerns your own and with your own spheres support the action of the Holy See. First of all, we should clarify precisely what is meant by the Holy See. In the strict sense, the Holy See or Apostolic See refers to the See of St. Peter and thus to the Pope as St. Peter's successor in that See. In its broader canonical sense, the Holy See refers to the Pope and the Roman Curia at the as the central organ of governance of the Catholic Church. If you refer to Canon 361 of the Code of Canon Law. Furthermore, at the level of international relations, the Holy See is considered and has been for centuries a sovereign juridical subject, independent from every other government or state. The Holy See is also the most ancient institution operating on the international scene, already in existence and active many centuries before the creation of the modern states, and still today universally recognized as a member of the international community, enjoying the proper prerogatives of a state to establish diplomatic relations and to enter into international treaties. The Holy See, then, should not be confused with the small territory we call the Vatican City State and where we find ourselves this morning, which is another international subject distinct from it and created, indeed, with the scope of assuring the liberty, independence, and autonomy of the Holy See. Nor can the Holy See be identified, sic et simpliciter, with the Catholic Church, which is the community of believers in Jesus Christ, united by bonds of faith and charity among themselves with their respective bishops and with the Bishop of Rome. Given this particular nature, the international action of the Holy See has the principal scope of assuring the liberty of the Catholic Church and of her pastors, so that they may carry out from their part, for their part, sorry, the mission of evangelization entrusted to them by the Lord Jesus. In addition to this, the Holy See itself, in the various contexts in which it operates, is committed to propagating that ethical guidance and those moral values coming from the Gospels and proposed by Christian faith and morality. The entire action of the Holy See, fundamentally, is at the service not only of the Church, but also of man himself, 
placed by God at the pinnacle creation with a dignity that is inseparable from his transcendent dimension. In this perspective, the Holy See acts firstly on the anthropological plane, which is built on this transcendent or religious dimension of human life, and which is antecedent to state institutions in the sense that its vindication does not depend on the recognition of the state and does not depend on the judgment of any legislator. The same transcendent dimension, however, needs definition and historical form in order to give it a concrete expression. And it is at this level that the Holy See acts with a commitment to address a fundamental message to all states in order that integral respect for human dignity become the fundamental norm of the international order and of every civil system, so that respect for human dignity becomes the yardstick for the legitimacy of all other rules of behavior. For this reason, in all its bilateral and multilateral relations, the Holy See insists on the primary primacy of certain principles, without which there cannot be a true civilization. Among such principles are found the right to life at every stage of its biological development, from conception to natural death, the right to form and maintain a family, the right to educate one's children, the right to work and to receive a fair distribution of its fruits, the right to a collective and individual economic development, the right of respect for the environment, the right to the freedom of thought, the right to freedom of conscience and of religion, the right to responsible participation in public life and to contribute to the common good, the right of access to justice and a fair process, etc. Another field of the Holy See's activity, apart from the anthropological, is the political international. Always guided by its spiritual mission, in this field the Holy See works for the creation of an international order based on justice that allows and assists states to assume their citizens' equality of access to the fundamental goods of material life, food, housing, work, etc., and of the intellectual life, such as education and culture, and also those that concern the spiritual life, freedom of religion and of worship, in all their dimensions. In the years immediately following the Second World War, the family of nations established a multilateral structure of coordination and common management of international affairs, with the aim of banishing war and promoting economic and social development in every country. The United Nations Organization and the various organisms, agencies, and programs associated with it was born. That international structure was not ignored by successive popes, who on five occasions have traveled to the UN headquarters in New York, Paul VI in 1965, John Paul II in 79 and 95, Benedict XVI in 2008, and Pope Francis last September. When he was there, he said, all of them expressed their great esteem for the organization which they considered the appropriate juridical and political response to the present moment in history, marked by our our technical ability to overcome distances and frontiers in history, marked by our technical ability, sorry, distances and frontiers, and apparently to overcome all the natural limits to the exercise of power. An essential response from the moment in which technological power in the hands of nationalistic or falsely universalist ideologies is capable of perpetrating tremendous atrocities. End of quotation. This is a quotation from the address of Pope Francis during his visit to the UN General Assembly. In the same discourse, he remarked that war is the negation of every right and a dramatic assault on the environment. If we want true integral human development for all, we must work tirelessly to avoid war among nations and peoples. End of quotation. Thus, peace among peoples continues to be at the center of the international activity of the Holy See. 
the significant proposals for international peace during 2015, the notable scientific and technological progress of recent years, a large part of which is thanks to the activity of private enterprises. The emergence of a vast global middle class and the release of billions of men and women from the trap of poverty. All of these gains can be undermined and indeed overturned by the grave conflicts ongoing in our world today, as well as by the persistent exclusion suffered by billions of human beings today. As you know, we still live with the terrible reality of dozens of open conflicts in various regions of the world. In addition, there is the persistence of many residual situations of conflict that have been only partially resolved and that continue to cause death, destruction, and suffering. Finally, situations of great instability continue in which war could once again break out. To the conflicts among nations and to the long-running civil conflicts, one must add newly developed non-state conflicts in the form of supranational national terrorist organizations and international criminal organizations, including those dedicated to drug trafficking and to human trafficking, with no regard to the moral law, which are causing so much harm to millions of victims. More specifically, the Holy See has never failed to manifest to governments and to international organizations the profound sorrow and concern of the Catholic Church for the difficulties of Central Africa, the Great Lakes region, South Sudan, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the many other situations of conflict and violence, many of them caused by criminal interests, which nonetheless lead to the loss of millions of human lives, to the gravest physical and psychological consequences among the survivors, especially among the weakest and the most defenseless, and to the destruction of cities and of precious infrastructure. In these contexts, the Holy See has used and continues to use all its diplomatic resources to contain the conflicts and to favor processes of reconciliation between governments and between peoples. The humanitarian organisms linked to the Holy See, such as Caritas Internationalis and the International Catholic Commission for Migrants, individual national Caritas organizations, both the developed and the developing countries, as well as the regional and national Episcopal conferences, engage generously to assist the victims of conflicts, to assist migrants and refugees, and all those affected by violence. They, are also, supports, they also support efforts at reconciliation. There are then certain particular conf situations of conflict among which those of the Middle East stand out. This region, which historically has had a decisive role in the birth and growth of our contemporary civilization, finds itself immersed in a drama that draws together every form of conflict and every type of subject. State and non-state actors, cultural and ethnic groups, as well as groups devoted to fundamentalist violence, conventional arms and arms of mass destruction, terrorism and criminal behavior, and the involvement, at times ill-considered, of states from outside the region. The destruction, the pain, the suffering, the hatred, the atrocities, and the unprecedented violations in human rights that characterize these conflicts are broadcast by the media in real time. With the risk of generating, by this repeated exposure, a paralyzing familiarization and indifference, such realities, however, should shake the consciences of the entire international community and of all men and women, forcing a new, a renewal and a reinvigoration of the juridical structures and of the existing politics, which must reshape themselves and move decisively to help with a generous spirit to limit and to heal insofar as it is possible the effects of the present armed crises. Also, the business community should feel itself challenged by this reality, which in some ways can have consequences for companies, for business leaders, for their workers and for their families. Furthermore, business leaders can, and in certain circumstances should, bring to bear their own moral influence to help political leaders to reflect and to move public opinion 
to consider more carefully those proposals for peace and solidarity tirelessly promoted by the Holy See. Together with these conflicts, and often as a result of them, we are witnessing today the exile of entire populations, a displacement which has now surpassed that caused by the Second World War. Populations and entire regions are now displaced, trying to flee from war, from persecution, from exploitation and poverty. This mass migration has recently moved to the center of political attention, more, however, because of the additional and unexpected inconvenience placed on the receiving countries than for the scale of the human tragedy seen in the price paid by thousands of innocent victims. The response to such mass displacement, owing also to concerns about terrorism and other local difficulties, especially in the most developed nations, has been a policy of refusal, exemplified in some cases by the construction of walls and barriers along na national borders. It is a tragic phenomenon which once appeared to have been left definitively behind by the events of the 1980s and 1990s. It represents an imp improvised and ineffective security solution that hides a painful display of withdrawal and indifference. In opposition to this tendency, however, many organizations together with hundreds of thousands of volunteers, coordinated or spontaneous, continue to mobilize in order to welcome our brothers and sisters who have been forced to migrate or to flee. This is another area in which you as business leaders can help to sensitize the political class and public opinion. The Holy See will continue to encourage governments to overcome every form of narrow nationalism and above all to recognize the unity of the human race, trusting in the potential of man when his dignity is respected and when he is treated as an equal subject, who can contribute in a reciprocal relation to the state, built on law and to the progress of society. Both recent and ancient history teach us that migrants, also in the most dramatic of upheavals, have always been a positive contribution to the host country. But more importantly, migrants are men and women who enjoy the same universal rights, above all the rights to life and to dignity. It is the task of all civil societies, including the commercial sector of those societies, to accompany this action and to engage actively in welcome welcoming and integrating migrants and refugees. As well as welcoming the displaced, the actual situation requires an urgent commitment to resolving the issues that force populations to flee or that compel people to migrate. The current crisis must become an opportunity to rethink and to change many political and economic decisions and to discuss in both public and private the most important questions concerning peace, security, the conditions for legitimate defense, and in particular, cooperation in favor of development. This consideration introduces the third and final general perspective which directs the action of the Holy See, and which might be defined as the ecological perspective. In both its environmental and social aspects, in the fullest sense of these terms, bearing in mind that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. That's a quotation from Laudato Si, number 49. In this perspective, the Holy See has encouraged the solemn commitment undertaken by the governments of the world to implement the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, a timely commitment that needs to be carried forward with courage conscious at the same time that without peace among the nations, it will be impossible to reach the objectives of progress and development. Pope Francis has also explicitly shown his appreciation for the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, which defines itself as a plan of action for the prosperity of peoples and of the planet, which also strengthens peace in the enjoyment of a broad liberty. The representatives of many governments have recognized that the eradication of poverty in all its forms and dimensions constitutes the greatest global challenge and that it is an indispensable requisite for sustainable development. To that end, they have promised to undertake the necessary courageous and transformative steps to attain and maintain a more just and stable world economic structure, 
one that is ecologically sustainable and capable of keeping peace with demographic growth and social changes. The Holy See has participated actively in the drafting process of the agenda. And already before the end of the negotiations, the Holy Father affirmed that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development represents a sign of hope for the whole of humanity. Equally, the Holy See participated in the negotiations for the binding Paris Agreement under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And at the third International Conference on Financing for Development, in Addis Ababa in July 2015, during which an additional ambitious plan of action was adopted, which is a necessary instrument for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. On another level, the encyclical letter Laudato Si offers to all Christians and to people of goodwill ethical and religious guidelines that correspond to the above-mentioned international commitments. Your own foundation in particular, indeed all Christian businessmen on the basis of Laudato Si and the international documents we mentioned, can find inspiration for developing commercial behavior and actions that will have a positive impact on the common good, on the protection of the environment and on the welfare of families. Unfortunately, the praiseworthy international proposals in favor of the environment and of human and economic development and also the new impulse that the Pope's teaching gives to business people and to other economic actors risk being undermined by war and the consequent humanitarian crises that worsen the already gravely disadvantageous situation of the environment and of various populations caused by poverty and an irresponsible exploitation of natural resources. The three perspectives that I have briefly traced, the anthropological, the political, international, and the ecological in broad terms, allow us to recognize how the Holy See assumes a role on the international scene that might be considered prophetic, recalling to everyone's attention the fundamental and overriding dignity of every human being, the necessity of bringing about an international order founded on harmony and peace, thus rejecting violence as a means of resolving conflict and the necessity of constructing a process of truly sustainable development, both for the good of the earth and for that of the human family in its entirety. To do this, we cannot simply protect our own interests, disguising them as rights, while ignoring the obligation to respect the rights of others. It needs to be remembered that no nation can guarantee its own security and its own economic and social well-being by isolating itself from the rest of the world, and without showing solidarity with other countries. The Holy See's position is also a call to responsibility by everyone, especially by those who occupy leading roles in civil society and in the direction of economic activity. During his address to the United Nations General Assembly, Pope Francis associated his own words with those of Paul VI 50 years earlier, but still valid today for political activity and for economic and business activity. I quote, the hour has come when a pause, a moment of recollection, reflection, even of prayer, is absolutely needed so that we may think back over our common origin, our history, our common destiny. The appeal to the moral conscience of man has never been as necessary as it is today. For the danger comes neither from progress nor from science. If these are used well, they can help solve a great number of serious problems besetting mankind. Pope Francis affirms that human genius, well applied, will surely help to meet the grave challenges of ecological deterioration and of exclusion. This applies particularly to you, business leaders and professionals. However, Paul VI cautions us, another quote, the real danger comes from man who has at his disposal ever more powerful instruments that are as well fitted to bring about ruin as they are to achieve lofty conquests. Civil society and the business world can make their own and implement at the national international levels what the Holy See says to governments, which in summary is that our common home must continue to be built on a right understanding of a universal brotherhood 
and on respect for the sacredness of every human life, of each man, of an each woman, of the poor, of the aged, of children, of the sick, of the newborn, the unemployed, the abandoned, of those judged expendable because they are considered nothing more than statistics. Our common home must also be built upon the understanding of a certain sacredness in creation. Such an understanding and respect demand a higher level of wisdom which accepts the transcendent element even in ourselves, which eschews the creation of an all-powerful elite and understands that the true sense of our individual and collective lives is found in the disinterested service of the other and in the prudent and respectful use of creation for the common good. Repeating the words of Pope Paul VI, the construction of modern civilization must be based on spiritual principles capable not only of supporting it, but of illuminating it and animating it. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks to your Jubilee pilgrims. So we have to join relatively quickly the, 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 the mass of people who are, who are trying to enter. The, uh, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> of course, you, you've spoken logically, basically, of the relations with state, of religious forces for the good, no? For uh, within. for Christian unity, the Pontifical Council for interreligious dialogue, the uh, Department for relations with Judaism, etc. But in the present uh, crisis throughout the world, and also under the impulse of this particular uh, pontificate, because Pope Francis comes from a, a lifetime of engaging other religious leaders both in his native um, Argentina and beyond. There is um, a recognition, I think, by states and international organizations of the religious dimension of human life in both a positive and a negative way. There is, uh, it is for a long time, uh, international diplomacy, international politics, had sort of said, well, yes, religion is all well and good, but it's something that really belongs to the private sphere. It's what you do on Sunday or Friday or Saturday, depending on your religious conviction. Now, of course, uh, everybody is aware that there is a strong religious dimension uh, to the crises that we are going through in the world today, particularly with regard to fundamentalist and extremist uh, Islam. Now, this is something that, that cannot be ignored, and so it's something that uh, uh, we um, recognize as well. And so diplomatic services of various countries and uh, nation states are recognizing the need to understand the religious dimension much more. Now, obviously, in some ways, this does not reflect always positively on religion. There will be a large number of people in the world today who would say, well, there you are. Religion causes division. It causes animosity and hatred. It causes uh, fundamentalism. And uh, some of this uh, cannot uh, be completely denied. We, we believe that fundamentally that the root causes of many of the conflicts in the world today are much deeper than religion, and sometimes they have a religious facade, but underneath there are many social, political, economic factors which are perhaps much more de determinative. But it does mean that there is a duty on the part of religious leaders 
uh, to combat a fundamentalism and extremism in all its manifestations, and that can exist uh, within Christianity as it can exist within Islam as well. And in addition to that, to work uh, so that there is greater unity and cooperation between religious leaders and between the communities that they guide. Now, we've had uh, certain uh, breakthrough events. The, obviously, the, the greatest one would be the meeting between Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and Pope Francis in Cuba a couple of months ago. After 1,000 years since the, nobody from representing Russian Orthodoxy or Universal Roman Catholicism had been able to meet. Now, it's a meeting which also has certain uh, aspects which are, 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 are also difficult. But it is, in my, in my, to my judgment, a sort of breaking through of a glass ceiling where the impossible is no longer considered the impossible. And therefore, I think we, we do believe that greater cooperation between religious communities and religious opinions of all time. Because fundamentally, there are common values, common beliefs. There is a one God. And uh, although our traditions and, and our, our teachings may be, may be quite different and contrasting and not without their problems, uh, at the same time, we probably do in the end have much more in common than we imagine or that we think and that we can do much more for the good of humanity uh, if we w work together. And so even at practical levels in terms of cooperation between charitable organizations of the Catholic Church or Orthodoxy or of, or of uh, the, uh, you know, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent and things like this, there's a lot to be done. Um, and the, the religious leaders obviously have, have to give, the, uh, give a lead in that. And the Holy See for its part through its various uh, through its, both its diplomatic activity and through the work of it, the departments here of the Roman Curia, we are obviously determined uh, to, to, to make our contribution, which may be modest in the end. The resources here, as perhaps you may have, may have guessed, are, are not infinite by any means. We, in, my, in our department, we're, when we, after all, we're, our responsibility is to advise the Holy Father on international politics uh, concerning principally our, our relations with over 180 countries in the world and a dozen international organizations, and we have to do that with 25 people. So it's, you know, it's, uh, most of the people who work for me in, in, a, in a large uh, foreign ministry would, would be, in the, be in themselves a department, probably. So we, we have to be realistic about what we can achieve, but of course we do, and this is what I will say, we do have uh, not just the resources of the Holy See, of the Roman Curia, not even the clergy, but we have the, re the resource of the Catholic people of the world, which is, is immense. Um, there is no uh, better um, intelligence network in the world than the, uh, than the parish priests of the entire Catholic world. You can, I always maintain you can find out anything you, you, you want to, if you really want to, in about 24 hours because you ring the bishop, the bishop rings somebody else, and the, somebody else reads the parish priest, and the parish priest gives you the answer. Because as we all know, parish priests know everything. But um, in addition to that, we do have this immense um, potential of goodwill and of religious faith and people's tremendous courage and their generosity. You have to remember that, you know, a very significant part of the educational institutions of the world are Catholic. A very large number of the health and medical facilities are the, the Catholic Church is the major actor in the world of HIV AIDS, for example. All, all these things are, the, and we can do more, of course we could do more, but we're all already uh, making a significant contribution. And so therefore we can, I think, rise to the challenge uh, that is before us. And we can do that also much better, obviously, in cooperation with other men and women of other faiths and men and women of goodwill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're going, huh?